So, so let's get straight into the final thoughts that I want to share with you. As you know, they are seed thoughts. And um, if you want to get the full picture of some of the of my train of thought in regards to the series, you can get it from our website or on the YouTube channel or the podcast. I know that the last time we met, I defined righteousness, but let me do that so that I'm not ahead of myself. I think in the first session, which I just cast some, just a a prophetic landscape or or, or an overview of some of the things that I, I believe the Lord is preparing for us, and one of it is that he's preparing us as an offering of righteousness. And so there will be purification, refinement, Uh, There will be some testings. I'm hoping that it's not going to be many. Really. But I think testing only comes in the areas of our stubbornness. And our lack of submission. But the ultimate is that we could be prepared as an offering of righteousness. And the sons of Levi were being prepared to be that offering. But righteousness by definition is a very, very complex uh, exploration. And it has to deal, the subject of righteousness has to deal with every facet of one's life. In fact, when I look at the Greek and Hebrew definition, I think... Sometimes when we read Strong's or Vines or one of the, 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 the students of Greek or Hebrew that gives us the definitions, the words that define righteousness get lost because of, because of the, our familiarity with the kind of words that they give us. And as a result... We don't understand how complex the subject of righteousness is. But this word is a word that, that conveys the, the idea of how God has designed for, for us as human beings to function in life. Let me put it in, in, in simple language. Before God created the human race. He had a design for how the human race should function. And if you want to define, at least to to have a one-line definition for righteousness, then righteousness is the divine, approved design depicting how the sons of God should conduct their lives in this world. Righteousness is the approved design or blueprint for how each one of us should conduct our lives in this world. That for me is an oversimplification. But one of the most, I think, the clearest definition I could give myself by reading into all of the Hebrew Greek definitions. That's the grand narrative. The grand narrative is that God designed our lives to be lived in a certain way. Part of that narrative, which is part of the grand narrative, is that the design was that we function as sons of God. That's module 101 in understanding the doctrine of salvation. That you are not saved from hell to go to heaven, which is the evangelical message. But the, the pre-existent message, the message of predestination or election, is that God foreknew us 
and chose us to be his sons. That's the, that's the grand narrative. If you know, not academically, not intellectually, not publicly or theologically, but if you know in your spirit, in your soul, and in your flesh that you're a son of God, whether you're a male or a female, you are saved. I'm not saying that if you know him on other levels, you're not saved, but that's the, that's the most intimate level of salvation. I call it module 101. If this is the grand narrative, righteousness, the pre-existent design, is that God designed the human race to function as his son. That for me is salvation. If we get caught up with the peripheral things, we miss the point. If you understand this, you cannot sin. You cannot sin. And now let me also, because we also have the wrong definition of sin. For most of us, sin is cheating, adultery, fornication, stealing, all of that. And yes, there are various tiers to the definition of sin. But if you read the epistles of John, like 1 John, he says there is a sin that is not, not unto death. And there are sins unto death. There is a sin unto death. And he says, there are sins that are directly linked against your body or your soul, but there are sins that can eternally separate you from God. But we have to firstly go and define the word sin. And the word sin in its basic meaning means to miss the point or to wander from the point of exactness to to miss the mark. And here's the point. The point is that God created the human race to be his son. If you get the point, you can't sin. You can commit moral sins. You can commit ethical sins. You can commit religious sins. You can, you can transgress things um, and, and violate protocols. But if you get the point that I am a son of God and you believe that, it's impossible for you to sin on that point. In other words, it's impossible for you to miss the point. To wander from the mark. That's why I'm saying it's not a theological thing. It has to be something that you know that you know that you know. Like you know your own mother and father. Like you know who your own biological kids are. You have to know that God is your father. And you are his child. That is the grand narrative of righteousness. He never created us to be Christians. He never created us to be believers. He never created us to be followers. He never created us just to be prosperous. He never created us just to be followers of a religion called Christianity or followers of Christ. He never created us to be disciples. He created us to be his sons. All of those things can fit into that picture. That's the grand narrative. And this is the approved design. It's the approved design. In fact, the more you see sonship, the more the scriptures will unpack, explode before you. I mean, I was reading, for example, let me give you an example. Matthew chapter 11. You know, so many people read these scriptures, but read it in isolation. Matthew 11. Verse 25. 
At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father. Mark the words, Father. Intimate relationship. You can't call somebody a father unless you're his son. I mean, in a normal context, if somebody came to me and said, Father, outside of the church now, and they're not part of my three boys, my Roland's going to get worried. <laughs> I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them to babes, to people in the incipient stages of development. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Now look at it. Come to me. So what do we do? We tell people, what's your need? Do you need a financial breakthrough? Do you have your... Have you, uh, do you have an illness? Uh, do you need a marital intervention? Come to Jesus, he'll answer you. He, that's not what he's saying. He says, the Father, I know the Father intimately. He knows me intimately. And I can reveal him or give that same dimension of a relationship to anyone. So then he says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So where is your rest? In the relationship of father and son. So to fulfill all righteousness, we have to start at, one, at, at the first rung of righteousness, which is, I'm a son. He is my papa. That's the relationship I have. And in that, I qualify to have at least submitted to the eternal purpose of righteousness. And if you believe that you're a son, you're righteous. But you can't believe if you do not, your life, the sums don't add up. Amen. See, with, Adam, uh, with, with, with uh, Abraham, it, there had to be an addition that took place over, I think, a hundred years. Because he died at the age of 175. He started his journey at 75. The book of Yashem, which you know is not an inspired book, but it's referred to three times in the Bible, it says that uh, Noah and Shem mentored Abraham for many years because his father was protecting him from the attacks of Nimrod. And they taught him righteousness. So he had a clue of some, some in, uh, or at least he had insights on righteousness, but it took him from the age of 75 to 175 to develop a lifestyle of righteousness before God calculated and summated and said, I can now classify this guy as righteous, and he becomes the source to all righteousness, not even Noah, who was righteous, not even Enoch who was righteous and walked with God, but he, Abraham, became the father of all righteousness. It is in the context of that, we have to develop a lifestyle. And it's, it's not coming. You know, let me say this, and I, I may contradict myself here, but I will say it. Some of us are more comfortable with spiritual fathering than divine fathering. Yes, you have to be a son of somebody to eventually be called the son of God. But the ultimate purpose of spiritual fathering is to introduce you to your divine father. That's the ultimate. It's not a political thing. It's how will somebody shepherd you into the relationship with your eternal father. That's why we, it, it's the dynamic between son of God, son of man. But most people are just, they become prisoners to the spiritual fathering 
wine skin without developing into the righteousness wine skin which is that God is my father I'm his son for me that is critical I, I can't make it even more simpler than this and look at what it says here take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light context because you, we can't read the scripture without understanding the pretext the context and the text uh, and the text forces us to look at the context and the context has to take us to the pretext and the pretext tells us that he's teaching us that unless you come to be yoked to the idea of sonship to God you will never understand rest for your soul and people don't understand it the greatest frustration i have is to see how many sons who are connected to me do not live in rest and prosperity because they think it comes to connection to grace not understanding that grace is only a conveyor belt to bring you to christ So the grand narrative is that righteousness is the divine approved blueprint depicting how the sons of God should conduct their lives on the earth. That's what we call positional righteousness or imputed righteousness. That we were aliens, strangers, enemies, slaves. We were disconnected, lost, and through the salvic work of Christ through the ministry of reconciliation we were brought into a position of righteousness which means sonship sonship that's the cardinal rule the practical side of it is that your position which is the doctrine of justification must now express itself in practical ways that is the doctrine of sanctification and the practical side and this is the sub narrative the sub narrative is that if you are a son of god god has designed every part of your life every component of your life to function by design there is no component of one's life that is left to our own imagination i was saying this to my church firstly there's a design for the gender call male You can't go and read it in some book you have to go to the bible and extract what is the pre-existent design for how males the gender called male the sex called male should function there's a design for it as is a design for the gender called female you can't interfere with it you can't contextualize it you cannot you can't add a liberal view to it you just simply have to know what is the design and then conduct your life according to the design that's the sub narrative and then there's the design for the gender called husband and the gender called wife in the relationship of the male and the female and there's a and the design is cast in stone you no matter how multi talented you are and it's got nothing to do with the historical definitions of patriarchy and matriarchy yes. the principle of headship i mean none of us have chosen our sex our gender at least none of us and we have no right to reelect what we want to be <laughs> the election has taken place and yes i can't speak to the world out there because they are not subscribing to the same bible but we can speak to our community and that shouldn't be hate speech if we're speaking to people who share the same faith yes. it should not be but that does not mean there should be domination and manipulation and autocracy and control because the bible is clear 
that there will be functional diversity in co-equality. And there is a sacramental nature to the grace that is transmitted when that design f- operates uh, in collaboration with the eternal plan. And so when we talk about righteousness, I'm beginning to realize that even in the microcosm of our lives, God designed everything. He left nothing to your imagination. So when we talk about righteousness, we're talking about design on a macro and micro level. There's a grand narrative and there's subplots to it. You, and and, and we, there's no way you can edit it. The reductionary principle cannot operate because that's what we call fig leaf Christianity. Adam did that. He interfered with design. So compliance to the design is deemed righteous by God. The sons of God exist in accordance with the divine design in their complex lives. And believe me, our lives are complex. And just think about it. Just think about how complex every one of our lives are. I'm a male. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a leader. I'm a friend. I'm a colleague. I'm a neighbor to somebody that I'm living next door to. I'm a citizen. I'm a private individual. And in every one of those classifications, God designed how you should live. And it is in the book, the steps... Of the righteous or a just man, just is the same, are ordered by the Lord. The Lord, he leads me in the paths, plural, paths, not one path, of righteousness for his name's sake. And we should not take the name of the Lord in vain. It's in the Ten Commandments. Which does not mean... Don't use the word G or oh God or the, uh, you know, the unpronounceable name, Yah. That's not what it means. We are the express image of God. And it, when it says we should not take his name in vain, it means we should not misrepresent him in our existence. Because we carry his name. So he leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, which literally means in every facet of our lives, we represent him and not ourselves. And if we are representing him, he then designs how we should function in our representation, whether it's in our vocation or whatever, and we are not living for ourselves, but for him. So we have to follow his design and not mine. That's righteousness. In the subplot. Which is so complex because, I mean, I'll say this publicly. You know, you grow up culturally. You imbibe bad habits. They transferred through, through, you know, genes. Through behavioral patterns. They become part of your psyche. I mean, the other day I was in India. We've got some India people here too. The Morrises are here. Welcome. Where are they? The Morris family from India is here also. The Nepalis and the, and the Indians are here. I don't, I'm not talking about the Phoenix Indians. No, that's, <laughs> I'm talking about the India Indians. <laughs> And it's amazing how when I went to India, I was hearing words like in Malaysia the other day. And they awakened, because the only language I can speak is English. And they awakened something in me. Suddenly I remember, it's like deep within my subconscious, I could understand what they're saying. (laughs) I felt like God just gave me the gift of tongues, (laughs) interpreting a certain language. 
I could just, I, I was listening to what they were saying. They didn't know I could understand it. And I realized it's in me. But you imbibe bad habits. You know the conclusion I came to? Confession time. I'm not the best husband. Because I imbibed a view of what a husband is. But it's not the biblical view. I vowed before the Lord. I vowed before the Lord that I will practice being a husband like Christ practiced it on his church. That I will serve my wife as if, I'm, as if Christ is serving his church. And if I can't serve my wife with the same love that Christ had for his church, how will I take care of that congregation? And obviously I fell short in so many other areas. The subplot is as important as the grand narrative. Grand narrative is I'm a son of God. And a son functions not by faith, but by obedience. Obedience has, does not have in its equation, in its worldview, the whole idea of rational thinking or choice. Faith does. Faith you can choose the measure you want to operate by. But, but the estimate locked up in obedience is all or nothing. You can't obey partially. partially. You can have faith by a measure. But obedience, absolute. And he learned obedience by the things he suffered or encountered. So he learned obedience. And obedience comes by submitting to a design which demands, and that's why I'm beginning to appreciate now something that I never saw before because, you know, when you think about apostles coming to the church and prophets, so he's giving fivefold ministers, and my whole view of fivefold ministry is radically being upgraded. I, I often saw it as more of, of a governmental thing coming to organize and structure the church, but now I'm beginning to see that when he gives us for example, apostles is giving us an overview of things that we cannot see. That were in, his, in the pre-existent design. And that design is helping us now to move, like for example, the city church concept. Move from individualism to a place we never saw before. Where the big church takes precedence over your small congregation. Now I'm beginning to see why he sends us apostles, not to be the head of a network, to travel to a few countries to claim to be an apostle. I mean, you can be a pastor and do that. But apostles come to have the big picture. When we were building our house, I appreciated the idea of master building, uh, which now would you know, be fulfilled by an engineer or a very good project manager who sees the whole picture and then brings in all the various contractors and manages them to fulfill the work. And the apostles are coming with a, the grand picture and also seeing the subplots and bringing in the skilled artisans so that those areas can be addressed in the building of the body of Christ. And uh, now... While the big picture is we function as sons of God, but the subplot is that we are, we are ubiquitously representing God in various aspects of our lives. And, 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 and in these various parts, there's a narrative from God that we have to follow. And there's detail to it. Let me tell you this detail. The refining that is taking place is frightening. threatening let's put it this way if any area of your life is presented in the court a divine court of law where God sits to judge over it 
This is how he judges it. He takes the template, the blueprint. He puts it over your life. And if your life does not fit into the blueprint, the pronouncement is not guilty. The pronouncement is unrighteous. If it fits in, then the pronouncement, the verdict is righteous. And what he uses to exalt his purposes is righteousness. It exalts a nation. And the nation is not South Africa. You're not going to get righteousness there. You're going to get democracy there. Democracy is not part of God's righteous plan. As is autocracy or communism or whatever. You're not going to get righteous men there. The nation he exalts is the holy nation. And they become the catalyst for exposing the systems of the world. So for me, it's not about me being a good man or a good husband or a good father. It's do I fit the plot? Do I fit the design? So the search for me now in the scriptures is not the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord, but I want to know how is it ordered. I want to know how many cubit it takes before glory comes. I want to know the measure of the thing. I want to know, I want to know the detail to the design. I want to know the iota to the sentence. So, so the focus is on going into the scriptures and saying, I can't play games. Uh, you know, the thing he hit me most with, and I'll jump a bit here and I'll start closing. I've got 28 minutes. But the thing he hit me with is that uh, the, the scriptures, apart from the fact that, you know, we know that the scriptures have been given to us by God, but one of the things is it's been given to us for the instruction in righteousness. All scripture, Second Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. This is a critical part. So I have to go back. This is the sola scriptura, back to the Bible, the Bible only, the pursuit for authenticity, for originality, for the pre-existent plan to be found. And, and that should be existent within the context. And so, um, and you know, when you read Hebrews 5.13, for everyone who partakes only in milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. And we can't go into that right now. But I want to jump a bit. And so instruction and in righteousness is very important. But I found something to be very interesting that's helping me to, this, to review the subject of offerings and employment. I've come to the place of realizing that my whole life, hear me very carefully, my whole life must testify that I'm righteous. And that what God receives as our worship is not the things we give him, the songs, the hands lifted, the prayers made, the gifts that we offer like first fruits, tithes and offerings. But what God looks for is our lives presented through symbolic offerings. In other words, our entire employment on the earth must demonstrate righteous living. And one of the indicators of our employment on the earth, I'm using, I'm very carefully using words here, employment, whether you're in full-time ministry or in any facet of life, you're employed. It must de demonstrate righteousness. Our gifts are a good indicator whether we are righteous or not, they can't lie. Every one of us 
our lives lived on the earth must be a representation of God. If it does not in any facet of our lives represent God, then we are classified unrighteous. Please hear me. Please hear me. Let me show you something. Hebrews 11 verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And the words more excellent here mean something that's preeminent, superior, uh, eternal, um, imperishable, uh, something that is incorruptible. And you know animals are not. They are smelly. No matter how beautiful they look, they are not clean. So how did he offer a more excellent sacrifice than Cain? Through which he obtained. Everyone say through which. He obtained, he obtained, he earned a credible verdict, a witness. Through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Please hear me carefully. It actually shook, the, it shook my life because uh, I thought I was a big giver. I have no problem giving hundreds of thousands of rands away. And I've done it. I try to do it regularly. It started small and it's become big. And sometimes beyond what I can do. I mean, beyond my capacity. I came to the, realize in recent times when I did the righteousness series that my offerings were not right. They were big, but not righteous. Sometimes I was giving out of sympathy, sometimes out of charity, sometimes emotionally, and sometimes just because I learned the principle of giving. Because that's the only way I can sustain myself. And I realized that I was not following a divine pattern. I then also subsequently discovered that God is not impressed by the amounts I give. I, I further came to discover, which I've already said in previous statements... That God does not receive money because he did not create it. And he does not receive anything that he has not created. He's not created money. The currencies we have. He's created gold and silver, but not rand and dollars and euro. We worship these things. But your gifts testify to your righteousness. That's what it says here. God testifying of his gifts. But your giving, your actions through giving, will testify or mitigate towards your righteousness. And re remember what righteousness is. It's compliance to an eternal standard, to a, to a divine design. There's a compliance here. So God didn't create money, but he would use it, or he'd use the animals, and so forth. Look at Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I've acquired a man from the Lord. And the key word here, acquired, I have created a man. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. In the process of time, which means time passed, careers developed, reputations were formed, profiles were now being defined. CVs were being written. Okay, process of time. Two careers. What are the careers? One's a farmer. 
The other is a herdsman, an owner of cattle. These are, these are not pastors. These are not prophets. These are not holy men. These are two people with careers. They came to test whether their careers are accepted before God. Whether God will accept what they present. That's what they came to check. They didn't know how to know whether they were pleasing God. Whether their lives were lived for themselves or for God. They were coming to check whether they were merely existing or they were representing God. So they brought an offering that Cain, in, in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord, the work of his hands. That's his salary. An expression of his career. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat, his career. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So what is the problem here? The problem is that Genesis 1.26 tells us that God created man to be his image and likeness. God did not create man to create his own vocation and career. We are designed for God to live in us. We have not been designed to fulfill our own destinies. We are God's dwelling place. We don't give him a space in us. He's not renting. He owns us. So no matter where we are, who we are, and what our stations in life is, I call it the ubiquitous principle. Wherever we are, our bodies is the dwelling place of God. It is in Him we live, move, and have our existence. He lives, moves, and has His existence in us. His presence in us is expressed in a diversity of ways. But the litmus test is very simple. How do we know that we are living for God or not? He allows our careers and the presentation of our careers, which is our salaries in the 21st century. Your worth is what you earn. You are weighed and measured by men. And they put a price tag to you. And the price tag is your worth. Whether you are earning an income in the church or in any vocation of life, your price tag is what you earn at the end of the month. That's your worth. Your worth is presented to God symbolically or emblematically through your wages. And when it's presented, we call it worship, worship. So he's not listening to your salary. But your salary will tell him whose image or whose reflection is represented in the employment. So if on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, you work for yourself. You pursued your agendas. You were driven by competition or by greed. 
and you carried your own persona into the workplace. But on a Sunday, you brought a tide, 10% to the detail. And presented it to God. He does not look at the tide. He looks at what you did from Monday to Saturday, represented in the tide. That's why he does not refine the offering. He refines you, the offering. So what you're presenting will tell him who you served. We know this. We really know this. It's in the Bible. Worship is not singing. If it is singing, then we hoodwink God for 2,000 years. If it is all the stuff we've done, then God is the biggest fool I know. Because he does not measure us by our lips. He reads the heart. And you can't, the heart cannot lie. The lips can. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 28, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God. It says serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. You know the story in Matthew chapter 4. Let me read it for you. Verse 5. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Remember, I'm just giving you one sample of a subplot. Now, in every facet of our lives, we are supposed to be righteous. Okay, I can be righteous now in some areas and unrighteous. I found that I was unrighteous in the way I treated my wife. And I thought I was a good husband. But lavishing her with things doesn't make myself a good husband. You have to fill the narrative. The narrative. The design. Now we're talking about work and employment, which is a 24-7 thing. Our whole lives exist. It consists in this. Look at this. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give His angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Verse 8. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and... Now mark the words, fall down, submit to me, come under my covering, and just serve, uh, worship me. Yeah. Worship me. And what would we think about worship? He's giving obeisance, you know, venerating, adoring, reverencing, etc. But look at what Jesus says. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall. Serve. So why would he add serve to worship? Like in Hebrews chapter 12. It's very simple. Service equals worship. And your worth is your service. So how you serve him is what he accepts on a Sunday. So what he's accepting on a Sunday is not what you do on the Sunday, but what you did from Monday to Saturday. And the dichotomy in the church today is that we switch off. 
and then switch on on the days that we have to. It's called hypocrisy. This is the duplicate life that we choose to live. Or we live dichotomously. And God is saying here, gifts indicate and testify whether you are righteous or not. So that immediately brought me into a position of asking myself, how am I living from Monday to Saturday? Or how am I living the whole year to present the first fruit? Say it. Because my first fruit is a representation of my year. And my tide is a representation of my past. I give into my future with my first fruit. And I give out of my past my tide. And people cheat and lie. I mean, some churches will not first root. They will not tithe of their tithes because they are not the Lord's church. They are the man who leads it. And, and that's true. Don't present it because it's not the Lord's. It's yours. But if you do present it, it's, you can't present it unless that church is totally absolutely the Lord's Monday to Saturday so that I mean our church would take the tide of tide out every Monday first thing tides tide of tide gets out but I'm beginning to ask myself the question how do you you know put that into the tide account the apostolic account how do you offload that if Monday to Saturday that church was existing for me was living for me. I was protecting my interest, feathering my nest, buttering my bread, sugaring my tea, making sure it was me, I. And then I want to present righteousness to God. We lie, we cheat. I mean, it's only God's goodness that has not created more catastrophes in the church like he did in the early church when Ananias and Sapphira did not lie to Peter, but to the Holy Ghost. I've seen selfishness. I've seen greed. I've seen corruption. I've seen... I mean, let, let me tell you something. When we talk about this offering... We are literally talking about how we're all being tested. And it's just our employments. So giving is one of the most explicit demonstrations of the principle of representation. They will tell you who you serve, who you worship. That's why the Bible says in Psalm 4-5, Offer the sacrifices of righteousness, not money. Not animals. That's why in the new covenant, God did away with all those sacrifices. And put your trust in the Lord. Psalm 4, 5. You know, Second Corinthians 8. Because at the end of the day... In the court of heaven, exhibit A, in the case against Namo, and B, and C, must be a life lived over a local house, over a global community of churches, over an itinerant ministry, and whatever else I do. A life lived. And all of those exhibits must mitigate and testify that they are the most accurate representations of a man who live for you and not for himself. That's all. That's God testifying of his gifts and he being dead still speaks. Still speaks. 2 Corinthians 8 
We read all these scriptures, but they just, they awaken to me. Verse 4 says, imploring us much more, uh, us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and fellowship of the ministering of the saints, but not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves. This is giving. They gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So these guys were not just generous givers. So th- this is what the Lord said, that if I'm presenting my first fruit, I'm presenting it to Segi, I'm not giving to him. I must first give myself to the Lord before I present myself to him. By the will of God. Am I living it like this? So your altar, which now will be whenever we do gather, some of you at the ABC forum on a Thursday, like tomorrow, and others on a Sunday in the church, is a place where you will be weighed and judged. God doesn't want your money. He wants you, but he can't get you. If he gets you the way he wants to get you, you're a dead man. (laughs) Dead woman. And if you really want to give him the way you should, that's called suicide and it will break the law so you can't do that. No one has the right to take their life. The only way you can present your life to him is in the things you do and give. One of it is your money. Obviously your worship in the form of songs, hands lifted up, etc. That's why biblical giving must inculcate this culture that Sagi spoke about, of mortification or sacrifice. Guys, please hear me, hear me, hear me, because I know that some of the most you know, exaggerated giving and selfless giving is taking place in forums like this. I mean, like what you did the other day to present an offering of 700,000, but it's an empty offering. It doesn't represent your heart in terms of how you want to see the city church come together. It's an empty offering if you gave it because Segi asked you to. If you, it's an empty offering if you're going to scandalize the ones now that didn't support you. It's empty if you're going to judge the one who still opposes you and not see yourself as standing in the gap for him. Righteousness is a high demand in the season that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. That's what Malachi 3 says. He's purifying us that we offer ourselves to him. You know what the Bible says of Abel and Cain? In 1 John chapter 3, I'll read this. Little children, verse 7, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness. Everyone say practices righteousness. In other words, you don't, you know, I've heard people say, they, they misquote 1 Corinthians 5.21, that we are the righteousness of Christ. That's correct, and it's not correct. You are not the righteousness of Christ. The Bible, and many people use it now for free grace teachings and for licentious living. The Bible says we become. We become. The word become, genomai, it's a word that speaks about progressive development. So while he is the standard of righteousness, we must become. That's why he gives us the Bible for instruction in righteousness. If you are the righteous, righteousness of God, why do you need instruction? So we are becoming. It's a process of generating, okay, developing. But this portion of scripture speaks about practicing righteousness. There's a praxis to it. 
There's a regimental culture. It doesn't happen overnight. You fail. You get up in the morning and you practice it again. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. Listen, the Son of Man, which is, or the Son of God, which is us also. We are manifesting that we might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus is a case in point. Whoever has been born of God does not. Remember what I said? For his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin. Because he has been born of God. And I'm not talking about adultery and fornication all that stuff. Those are sins of the soul and the flesh. We can talk about that. There's, a, there's various definitions to sin. In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifested. And Segi was talking about manifestations today. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning. That we should love one another. And it was not there from the beginning. There's no quotation of it. What does that mean? To practice righteousness, you have to practice love. Especially with the ones that are hateful towards you. Not as Cain who was wicked, was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his employment, that's what the word works means. We're evil. He was focused on the wrong things. And his brothers, righteous. One man's employment was righteous, the other's, other was unrighteous. The workplace must become a place where we practice love and not murder. Love is an act of benevolence. You can go and read all the other portions of scripture, but my time is up. Please go and study the giving chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, in this context. Um, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. And you can read on about how to increase the fruits of your righteousness, not of your giving. So brethren, I'm speaking in piecemeal, I'm scattering seed, my time is up. But you're getting my heart. You think we can get to the standards of righteousness? You know what, we're in big trouble. We can't hate anyone. We have to stop the rumor mill. Some people love gossip and bad news. Some people just love to see somebody fail. And even if the world, you know, even with people that are unkind towards us, we have to be a representation of God. So let's just stand and bring ourselves before Him. I'll share some of these thoughts tomorrow at Dr. Segi's forum, some that I did not share today. But let's. Um,